All right, so we're in page 21 of your handout. So if you don't, uh, if you're not already open there, then go there. So here's what we want to do. Um, for a few minutes now, I want to talk to you about some themes that have been very formative for me in thinking about how to engage culture with a Christian worldview. And then we're going to talk specifically about contextualization. Um, and contextualization will lead into tomorrow, we'll talk about preaching, we'll talk about community life, and we'll talk about faith and work discipleship. So this is sort of the trajectory of where we're going. But I want to talk now, and these ideas, I'm just telling you up front, once you grasp them, I think they'll be transformative and very helpful for your ministry, maybe even your own Christian life. But they're new concepts probably for you guys. So it'll take a few minutes for us to wrap our heads around them. So we're talking about, again, middle of page 21, engaging culture with a Christian worldview. The first thing that I want us to pay attention to is what we call structure and direction. Um, this comes from a book called Creation Regained, and the subtitle of the book is Recovering a Reformational Worldview. So it's the idea, what does it look like to have a worldview shaped by the doctrines of the Reformation? Have you guys read Kuiper at all this year? Abraham Kuyper, a little bit. So it would be very similar to something like that, Herman Bovink or J.H. Bovink, some of the same ideas. But this book is trying to, um, you know, sort of address some modern concerns or some modern questions. What the authors of this book do pretty early on in the story is they offer two categories, which I have found to be immensely helpful in thinking about Christian cultural engagement. And the two categories they offer are called structure and direction. So let's read. Structure denotes the essence of a creaturely thing, the kind of creature or creation it is by virtue of God's creational law. Direction, by contrast, refers to a sinful deviation from that structural ordinance and renewed conformity to it in Christ. So, when God made the world, he made lots of things. He made Adam and Eve, he made creation. He also created what you might call institutions, marriage as an example, sexuality, politics. Um, it's right there in the Garden of Eden. Work, God gives Adam and Eve a job, uh, till the land. So what Al Walters, is saying is that in creation, there are things that God makes that have a structure to them, a kind of essence that is innate to the thing that has been made. Is that you with me? Does that make sense? Direction refers to the way in which that thing is used either to glorify God and advance his values in the world or to rebel against God and to serve human beings instead of him. So I'll give you an example. Uh, because it's a very vivid one, very obvious one, God made sex, and sex is a creational good. God made it as something for a married couple to both procreate and also to delight in each other. That's the structure. It's a creational good. But the direction of sexuality is often not used in God-glorifying ways. It's often used instead of honoring God to serve self, to honor self, to gratify self, to take advantage of others. And so direction refers to either the sinful use of something or how it can be redeemed and redirected to God's glory and to advancing Christian values in the world. Now here's why that matters. Because if you're not critical in thinking about creational goods like sexuality, it would be possible for some Christians and churches to think, wow, look at all the bad ways sex is used in the world. Sex is bad, sex is taboo, let's not talk about it. And you start to have a view of sexuality that doesn't actually reflect God's creational goodness. So what we as disciples engaging worldviews want to do is be able to discern what is something structure, what's the creaturely essence that God himself made, and then what is the direction that that thing is going either to glorify God or to dishonor God and to serve and honor humanity instead of God. 
why don't we practice structure and direction with these two categories? So I want you guys to do politics. So what's the structure of politics? What's the directions of politics? Talk about that. I want you guys to do money, the use of money in the world. What's the structure? Is there a structure? And what's the direction? What are the directions? So take some time, talk about that. We'll come back and we'll learn from each other. Yeah, yeah. So I would say that politics is, in Genesis 1 and 2, the name, the word isn't, but the idea is. And so I'll challenge you to look for that. We can talk more about it. But yes, then what you want to do, and you can think about it, the political system right here in Ethiopia. You could think about politics in general. But just reflect on, as you discern the structure, how do you go forward and see what's the direction or directions. Money's a little harder. I think it's a little harder to make a case that there's a reference to money in Genesis 1 and 2, but think more about what money is and what it does and see if you can find any patterns in Genesis 1 and 2 and then go from there. Make sense? Well, we'll start with you guys. So politics, structure, direction. So let me just, before we go to direction, let me just say you guys are absolutely right. So when people say, is there politics in the Bible? Is there politics in Genesis? I say, well, it kind of depends on what you mean. If you mean, is there democracy in Genesis 1? No. Is there, is there Marxism? No. But God is the supreme king of the universe, makes Adam and Eve to rule over creation in his stead. And specifically, what he tells them to do is to cultivate the resources that are around them so that other people can flourish, which is what politicians should do but that's getting in the direction. So if you think about it in that way, of course politics is in Genesis 1. Adam is to rule over the earth as God's representative. So absolutely, and then the direction. Yeah, good, good. How was doing that exercise? Was it challenging, was it helpful? Challenging, but good. So, you know, what I want, basically the reason why I think this uh, uh, category or this tool is so helpful is because um, sometimes what happens is, you know, you know you're having a, a conversation with somebody, you know, after church on Sunday and they're, you know, maybe not the current prime minister, but maybe they're complaining about some politician or some policy and they say something like, oh, we'd be better off without any politics. No politicians, you know. And I think what happens sometimes is Christians don't feel compelled to renew the culture because the culture seems so far gone that we might as well just dismiss of it in the first place. What structure and direction tells us is the answer to bad politics is not no politics, it's redeemed politics. That's the value of structure and direction. So as Christians, we never want to give up on anything that God has made. But we also don't want to give in to the sinful ways those things are directed when they're not done under the lordship of Christ. We want to see redeeming, redemptive work. Now, to be clear, that doesn't necessarily mean we want only Christians in political office, but it's to say we want politicians to operate the way Adam was supposed to operate, which is serving others rather than self, cultivating resources so that more people flourish. It's a renewed way of thinking about politics, not just the faith of the politicians, but what politics is for. Most politicians today, at least in the places of the world that I'm from, why do politicians make the decisions that they make most of the time? It's because they don't wanna be voted out of office. They wanna stay in power, and so they do whatever they can do to keep enough people happy with them to vote them in power which is not always the same as governing in a way that's good for people. So we want a politic in which people are shaped by the biblical vision, which is steward the earth, cultivate resources so that everyone can flourish. That's what redeemed politics could look like. So well done, guys. Good, okay, so you're, you're of the position that maybe there was, let's call it like something like currency or a way of uh, calculating value that you could exchange with others to share goods, share resources, is a way of subduing the earth. And the rest of the guys disagreed with you, they said. Yeah, no, that's good, that's fine. So, so here's why this one's interesting, because it's harder to find a specific example in Genesis of money. Like you don't see Adam going to Eve, like I'm gonna run out to the coffee shop, do you want anything? 
and like binds, like there's, there's none of that, right? So it's a much harder thing to find structure in. And I purposely give this example because I want you guys to wrestle with what does money represent? What is money for? What should it be for? And can we connect that to any creational reality? So did you guys have any more discussion about anything like that? You say me? Very good. So you've sort of, uh, you know, you've taken this command to do the earth and you've thought about, okay, how would that happen practically? And you've looked at the ways in which money or currency is a way that you facilitate that process because human beings exchange things that they need in order to fulfill God's command. Really helpful. Um, were you going to add to that? Yeah, that's right. Yeah, it's hard to know what exactly that means, like where people craving gold as a commodity, but I think you're right. And it's important to remember when you read Genesis 1 and 2, it wasn't like this all happened, you know, in, in 15 minutes. Like this is a description of the world is its beginning and spreading. So it does seem like early on in the life of the world is this recognition of beauty. There's this recognition of uh, there are resources on the earth that have value that we can share and use to cultivate and make things. Absolutely. So, okay, that's great. So what are the directions, plural, that money can be taken in or currency can be taken in? Yeah, that's, so that would be the positive way of, of the direction. So Money exists. Uh, currency exchange is part of humanity. We need it in order to flourish. We can share expertise. We can share resources with each other. Great. Um, <clears throat> the redeemed way of using money is basically to keep doing that, to use our money to help other people thrive and flourish, to, to, um, to share, to care for the needy, etc. The The direction of money selflessly, uh, selfishly or sinfully is now we don't use money to serve God and serve others. We use money as a way of building an identity or by oppressing other people. So I am how much money I have. That's my identity. That's my, my worth. My meaning in life is connected to my bank account. Or I accrue money. I hoard money to have power over people who don't have money. Um, that's another way that the direction of money is, is used in a, in a way that doesn't honor God. So the issue is not money is bad. The issue is not, you know, we should all be communists and just, you know, all have equal everything per se. The, the goal is to say there is a way to use money that's more shaped by the Christian story, which is an attitude of self-sacrifice, not an attitude of self-preservation. Um, so again, the structure is there. It's the direction that either needs to be challenged or redeemed. So you can have Christian bankers. You want to have Christians in finance. You want to have people moving money around in the world, but trying to do so in a way that is focused on the values of God's kingdom, not just personal gain and advancement. Make sense? There's very few big topics in the world that you can't do the structure and direction thing with. So my encouragement would be next time you face a hot button issue or a cultural issue that's a challenge in your context, in your church, Try to think of it in terms of structure and direction and see where you go. Why don't we do this next section and then we'll talk about contextualization. So much like structure and direction, shadow and sunbeams has been very significant to me in how I think about how Christians consume and interact with culture. Why don't you guys open up your Bibles to Psalm 19? Psalm 19 is sort of the jumping off place for this. Okay, you guys there? Psalm 19? So here's what the psalm says. Um, and actually, if you, so you may know that Psalm 19 is this really interesting poem. It's almost like it's been two poems jammed into one because verses one through six is all about general revelation and verses seven through 14 is all about special revelation. What is general revelation, by the way? Right, God reveals himself in nature and then special is in scripture and in Christ. So verses one through six are all about general revelation. I just wanna show you. Verse one, the heavens declare the glory of God. The skies proclaim the work of his hands. That's the psalmist's way of saying you go outside and you look up and you know something about God. We saw this in Romans one. Was that day one? I can't remember. That's like a long time ago. Maybe not so much for you guys, but for me. Uh, verse four, their voice, the voice of creation goes out into all the earth, their words to the ends of the world. In the heavens, verse four, God has pitched a tent for the sun. It's like a bridegroom coming out of his chamber, like a champion rejoicing to run his course. 
It rises at one end of the heavens to make its circuit to the other. Nothing is deprived of its warmth. Okay, follow me. Here's what's happening in Psalm 19. The psalmist is praising the revelation of God in creation. He's saying, you just look out, you look up, and you see evidences of God's presence. And for the psalmist, what is the chief part of creation that reveals God's presence in this psalm? The heaven, sure, but there's a specific thing that God has made that has you know, more attention than anything else in these verses. The sun. Look at the sun. Starts in verse four. God has pitched a tent for the sun. It's like a bridegroom out of his chamber. That's an image of, you know, strength and, and uh, you know, virality. Like he's just, you know, he's a champion rejoicing around its course. It rises at one end of the heavens and makes its circuit to the other. What the psalmist is saying basically is this. The sun is powerful. The sun is unavoidable. I was I like were we talking earlier, I don't like the sun. Like if I like when you're outside in the sun, you can't hide from it. I mean you can maybe try to get some shade or something, but the sun gets after you. And notice verse six, nothing is deprived of its warmth. It just, you know, in the desert it it's hard to hide from. What the psalmist is saying is the sun is the maybe chief thing in terms of power, in terms of intensity in the natural created world. Are you with me so far? Okay. So what I want you to consider is this. How do we know that the sun exists? You can see it. So you could look up at the sun, which could hurt your eyes, but you could see it. You could also see the sun rays, right? You could see sun hitting buildings or sun hitting a car that's driving by. And you say, that's the rays of the sun, right? But is there another way yeah, heat would be another example of that. But is there another way that you can be aware of the sun's existence? What? Darkness. Shadows. The other way that you can be aware that the sun exists is by experiencing its absence. So when you see a shadow, what you're seeing is a place that the sun hasn't gone. You're seeing a place where the sun is missing and you know and you experience the missing nature of the sun in the presence of a shadow. So what Dan Strange does in his great book, which I've referenced before, is he says, what if we thought about that in terms of culture? What if we learn to think of culture not in terms of, well, that's good or that's bad, but rather if we said, that's a shadow or that's a sunbeam. That's something that reveals the beauty and the glory and the wisdom of God, sunbeam, or that's something that reveals life apart from God, hopelessness, judgment, darkness. And what if we began to watch stories and read novels and listen to the news and read Twitter, not thinking about, oh, culture is bad or culture is great, but rather if we said everything is revealing God, either in terms of shadows or sunbeams, either in terms of God being glorified and his values being extended, or God being dishonored and ignored, and we see a world devoid of God, hopeless and dark. Does that make sense? So what Dan Strange would say, and I think he's absolutely right, is when you watch a movie, Maybe the categories that Christians should have is not, oh, this is a good movie, or oh, this is a bad movie. I mean, in terms of its morality or its ethics. You know, some are just not entertaining, and that's a different story. But what if we said not, this is a bad movie or a good movie? What if we said, in this movie, I discern the sunbeams of God's glory, or I see the shadows of God's absence? I see what sexuality looks like apart from God. I see what family life looks like apart from God. I see what the use of money looks like apart from God. Or at the same time, I see what courage looks like as an example of God's presence. I see what joy looks like as an example of God's kindness in the world. So what we want to do as Christians who are engaging culture is we want to think about structures 
redeem directions, and then learn how to see and tell stories as shadows and sunbeams. So when someone comes to you and says, can I watch X movie? Your answer probably isn't yes or no. It's a discipleship moment where you can say, as you watch the movie, here's what we want to pay attention to. What are the ways that God is honored? What are the ways that the values of the kingdom are put forth as a beautiful thing? Or what are the ways that we see humanity in darkness and the hopelessness that comes from walking away from God? Or how do we see people who glory in sin and see that as actually a reflection of judgment and shadow, missing out on all that God has for them? That's how you better disciple people to face the world. Not as it's good, do it, or it's bad, stay away from it, but actually shadows and sunbeams. Make sense? So why don't we do this? Um, why don't we pick a movie and talk about the shadows and the sunbeams in it? Is there a movie that's been popular recently among, you all seem like you're roughly the same age? Doctor Strange? Oh, that's a good one, sure. So why don't, have you all seen it? Sammy's not happy with any of you right now if you've not seen it. Well, why don't, you, why don't we do this? Why don't you guys just, uh, why don't we take a few minutes, we'll do this privately, just pick a movie that you've seen within the past year and just jot down where do I see shadows and where do I see sunbeams in this film. Do your best to, to just come up with a few ideas and we'll share them together. Okay, go ahead. So your job as a Christian is to see the shadow for what it is, to say, in watching this film, I see a culture that has separated sexuality from God, and I know what the judgment and the destruction and the pain and the heartache that's connected to that. So it's not that you can't consume the story, but you see the story as revealing an industry, a culture, uh, a set of values that are opposite of God. So you see God's judgment, the shadows in that. So it isn't that you won't watch, I mean, maybe you shouldn't watch the movie, but the point is, it isn't to say, you know, uh, oh, that, that, you know, we're, we're going to just dismiss it entirely. It's to say, how do we think about engaging with it from a Christian perspective, which is to see it as revealing the use of sex apart from God, which is a sign of judgment and rebellion and something we want to encourage people to move away from. That, that, that's how I would think about it. Okay, so privately, just pick your favorite movie. This will be fun because we'll get to learn about everybody's favorite movie over the past year. And just jot down a couple bullet points. Where was a shadow? What were some shadows? What were some sunbeams? And let's see, let's process this together, okay? So let's take maybe five, 10 minutes to do that. All righty, who wants to go first? Who feels like they had something that came to mind and they were able to discern some shadows and sunbeams? Okay, Pirates of the Caribbean, yeah. yeah. Good, very good. That's very, very good. Very, very um, good application of biblical ideas, but also just a, an honest acknowledgement, like the complexity of the human story as we're rooting for this guy who's kind of an underdog, kind of a unlikely hero, maybe a little bit shady. And while Jesus certainly isn't shady, but he's the underdog. He's the unlikely hero. He's the one that no one expected. But out of true love, he risks everything to save his love. You know, um, So I'm not saying that Jack Sparrow is the type of Jesus, but there's an element of there's an element of that. There's a reason why our hearts resonate with those stories because the true story is is like that. So very good. You had one? The good lie. Yeah. Okay, I don't know it. Yeah. Interesting too, the way you're describing that. I've not seen the movie, but it makes me think that the very presence of a title like that reveals the brokenness of our world. That sometimes to do a good thing you have to lie. And that's evidence that we live in a world that's broken, that you have to deceive in order to overthrow oppressors or to hide from people who want to hurt you, that kind of thing. Um, so it's an example of, wow, we live in a broken world. We live in a world in which people are forced to resort to things like that in order to be safe. So well said. Thank you. The Crown? Oh, yeah, you watch The Crown. As a British person right now, you know, that is a big deal. Yeah. Good. Good, very good. Uh, on that last point, I think that shadow is a really interesting one. You see that replayed in a lot of different, whether it's movies or books or just life experiences of the people that will come to your church, is that of competing ambitions. How do I juggle my responsibilities at work with my responsibilities at home, with my responsibilities to 
pursue a life of discipleship and my quiet time's all that. So I think that shadow of the, the way in which people experience a real sense of fragility or weakness because of their inability to manage all the things that are on their plate is a real part of the human condition in a broken world. So that's a really good spot of that shadow. Someone else, maybe, maybe over here? Game. Oh yeah, Imitation Game, yeah, 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 good, great film, yep. Yeah, it's an interesting film because you have a creative genius who does a lot of good, but whose personal life is hard for some other people to accept. And one of the shadows that I see in that film, which I think continues to be a challenge and a burden for Christians and for churches, is how do you genuinely love a person, love a neighbor, even if they have beliefs or practices in their life that maybe aren't aligned with God's values and God's purposes? What does it look like to love, to celebrate the accomplishments of a person, while also at the same time being able to um, you know, maintain a sense of, uh, of, uh, of an ethic that's shaped by scripture? So that's a really good example of the complexity of, uh, of sort of that creative genius and all the good things that God brought into his life but also the ways in which there's uh, sometimes a failure of community to, um, to know how to, to interact with someone that might be different than they are. So well done, it's great. So friends, you know, I know uh, we're doing a lot of exercises. Part of that is it's more helpful for you to do that than to just listen to me drone on for, you know, four hours straight. Um, but, you know, these ex- all these things, um, you know, after 12 years of pastoring, I'll tell you that this stuff really helps people. If you can help people start to grasp categories like structure and direction, shadow and sunbeam, it frees people from feeling like they're either in or out of culture, like I have to be all in it or I have to stay out of it, but it gives them a a reformational worldview, a, a discipleship worldview that enables them to think creatively, critically, um, and then also celebrate common grace in almost anything. There's very few things in the world that are just purely evil that have nothing, uh, nothing to celebrate. Um, they're there for sure. But most of what we experience on a day-to-day basis, there's shadows and sunbeams in them. And discipleship means learning to, to see both and to, to be more drawn to God because of the presence of both um, doing so shaped by scripture. So I hope that's helpful. I hope that's interesting. Alrighty, guys. Um, so we're on page 21. We're putting it into practice. So we're going to talk about contextualization. Uh, In this section, what you can think of is uh, us trying to begin to apply how all that we've talked about makes its way into the pastoral ministry that you're practicing. So you're preaching, your pastoral care, your um, meeting with non-Christians, how do you take all of what we've done, all the conversation about all apologetics, all the conversation about what is culture, what is a worldview, contextualization is how you bring God's truth to people uh, in the midst of all that. So as we begin, here's a couple of questions that I want to just put out there that I want you to sort of reflect on as I ask them. How do you effectively proclaim God's unchanging word in an ever-changing world? Here's another question. (laughs) Why is it that you can listen to a talk on the Bible or a sermon that is doctrinally accurate and yet totally boring and dull? You guys ever had that experience? You listen to a sermon, you're like, everything he said is true, and that was, I, I, it was hard to stay awake. Why is that? Are you able to share the gospel in such a way that is clear and compelling with people who don't identify as Christians. Have you ever shared the gospel with somebody and had them say to you, oh wow, I never heard it like that. That's really interesting. Why are certain models of ministry very effective in one context, e.g. a suburb, but ineffective in another, a city? Some of you know that. You've been in churches in suburbs, you've been in churches in rural areas, and then you come to a city And you notice that the models of ministry or the ways of preaching or the ways of organizing a community that are really effective in one place aren't effective in another. Why? Well, one way or another, all of these questions bring up is the issue of contextualization. Contextualization in the content of what we say, 
contextualization in our ministry programs, our strategies. The question is, how do we faithfully bring God's word to our culture and our communities? So before we look at definitions, what would you guys say is contextualization? How would you define it? How to take the message and make it relatable to the people you're talking to. Good. Making it accessible. Yeah, so relatable, here's why you need it, accessible, you can understand it, good. So maybe contextualization doesn't just inform what we say, but how we say it, the methods, the person that we are, the modes of communicating, really good. Anything else? So showing someone why what you're talking about matters for them. Yeah, it creates a sense of urgency, it creates a sense of need, creates a sense of I want that, absolutely, very good. I think contextualization is all those things. It's, it's accessibility, it's understandability, it's, um, it's flexing as messengers, you know, it's creating a sense of need in the listener. So when we talk about defining contextualization, it's important to see what it isn't as well as what it is because sometimes when people are talking about contextualization, what they're really talking about is changing the gospel to fit in with the culture. And that's not contextualization. So let's see. Contextualization is not merely giving people what they want to hear. Oh, my people don't want to hear about sin, so I'm not going to preach on that. I'm super contextual. Like, that's not contextualization. Contextualization is not relativism. It's not changing the message or helping people feel like the demands of the gospel aren't very high. As Brian just said, what becomes flexible is the messenger and the modes of communicating, not the message itself. I have a footnote here. When I talk about modes of communicating, let me be clear. Some of the modes that God has ordained for us to communicate his word are unchanging. He has designed that the gospel is proclaimed through preaching. If someone says, we're not gonna do preaching anymore because that's not what our culture wants, I would challenge and say, actually, God has designed his word to be proclaimed through preaching, so we must preach, it's part of the church life. But what I would also say is that our styles of preaching, how we preach, what we wear when we preach, what kind of visual aids we have as we preach, all of those things can or cannot be changed to meet the needs and the context and the culture of our hearers. So we're not saying that all modes of communicating the gospel are up for grabs, but what we are saying is that in each of the modes, there are ways of changing our approach to meet the moment and meet the culture. But what really is important is the messenger is the one who's flexing, not the message itself. So if that's what contextualization is not, let's talk for a few minutes about what it is. Proper contextualization aims at presenting the biblical gospel to people in language they understand and through appeals and arguments that land with them in force. Both of those things are important. So let's talk first about language. Uh, You guys are an interesting place, right? We're in Addis, but we're speaking English. The church meets in English, and that's reaching a certain kind of person. There may be instances, I was talking with one of you yesterday, about a people group that you want to reach and serve here in the city, and it may require learning a new language. Because when you're presenting the gospel, you want to be the one doing the flexing, inviting people to interact with the gospel because we flexed to bring the gospel to them rather than hoping they learn our language. At the same time, though, I want to be clear that language doesn't just refer to English or Amharic or something like that. It also refers to the kind of words we use when we are talking about the gospel. I can't really remember the past couple of days and all the things I've said, but did we talk about Christianese yet? I feel like we must have at some point. A little bit? So the idea there simply is when you talk about the gospel, especially to persons who are not churched or who are not mature in their discipleship, maybe people who aren't Christians, you always want to be looking at your language to say, am I using words that I know to be biblical and true, but that these people will have no idea what they mean. 
And if so, that's okay if you need to use those words to communicate a certain point, but are you taking the time to explain them and unpack them, aware that the persons you're speaking to may not understand what's happening? That's what we mean by language. It's avoiding Christianese. And you know, I, I know in your guys' um, you know, your, uh, uh, your course curriculum, you spent time talking about the Reformation, right, in your church history classes. Is, is that right? I think I saw that. You know that one of the, um, the, uh, the major reasons why the Reformation was so successful is because they brought the truth of the gospel and the truth of Christianity into the language of the common person. They went from the Latin mass, which was impossible for most people to understand, to speaking in French or German or English. And when that happened, people who wanted to know the truth finally found it accessible. Well, I'm saying that our language to be contextual must include the same things, but it's not only speaking English or Amharic, it's looking at our words and making sure that those words are accessible. If they're not, find different words or at least define them and make sure that you help people understand. Does that make sense? Okay. The other thing that I wanna talk about here is not just language, but through notice appeals and arguments that land on them with force. In every culture, there are certain stories, there are certain references, there are certain images that people respond to. Do you remember earlier today how we began our teaching time with the story of David and Nathan? Why was that story when Nathan brought the parable to David so impactful to David? Well, part of the reason is because David was a shepherd. <laughs> David loves sheep. David knows how important it is to take care of sheep, to lay down your life for sheep. So when Nathan tells David a story about someone not honoring sheep and taking advantage of somebody else's sheep, David is infuriated because the argument and the illustration hits him with force. You have to know what kinds of arguments and appeals will land on the people you're speaking to with force. The kinds of images that will help the penny drop. You can say, the gospel justifies you by faith in Jesus Christ, so you no longer have to prove yourself in the eyes of God. That's powerful. But what if you said to that same person, because of what Jesus has done, you can rest from trying to earn the approval of other people. You can finally know that you're safe and you're accepted in the eyes of God. That's gonna be a little bit more accessible, maybe especially in a shame on our culture. So all I'm saying is when you talk about the gospel, you want to find the arguments, the illustrations, the references that appeal to people so that they have access points to grasp the gospel that you're proclaiming. Another broader definition of contextualization, Tim Keller puts it this way, contextualization is giving people the Bible's answers, which they may not want to hear, to questions about life that people in their particular time and place are asking doing so in language and forms they can comprehend and through appeals and arguments with force that they can feel. Tim's definition is helpful and he's actually critiquing those who say what pastors need to do is give people what they want to hear. No, sometimes your presentation of the gospel is exactly what somebody doesn't want to hear. They don't want to honor God. They want to live in rebellion. They want to pursue whatever things that they feel like are important in their life that might be in opposition to God. Your job is to give them God's answers, the Bible's answers to questions about life, but doing so in a way that those people can grasp and understand. So proper contextualization finally is fluid and it's more static, uh, more than st uh, it's, it's more art than science. Um, we've talked about this actually in day one, probably in the first hour but just like apologetics, good contextualizers are really creative. They're really sensitive to the moment. And they're able to quickly change on their feet, to move in a way if they see the spirit moving, but also if they find a way to connect better with their audience. So it isn't to say, to put it differently, that contextualization is a simple model that once you learn it, you've got it forever. It's a skill, it's an art that you employ over time and knowing that things change. The way I contextualize, so in New York, I could get people to laugh at my jokes. In the UK, silence. Like, like just people don't make jokes in sermons and people, don't. so I've had to try something else to sometimes get people engaged and keep it interesting. 
th that's not exactly what we're talking about with the message of the gospel, but it's sensitivity to the moment, recognizing that what works in one place may not work in another. And your job is to be the one to flex. Your job is the one to adapt, not to assume that your people will do that for you. So that's a little bit of, you might say, a definition around what contextualization is, both in the Bible, uh, sorry, uh, defined uh, kind of broadly the way the, the terms are used. Yeah, so I think it's twofold. So I think one, if you're talking to an individual, then part of what you're wanting to do is find out what are the actual questions that that person is asking and see how the gospel speaks to them. So there may be certain aspects of the Christian faith that the person you're talking to just isn't interested in. The other element though, as it relates to preaching, and then you'll tell me if this doesn't address your question, the other element that addresses preaching is this idea. When you preach, you know, you wanna, nothing is more important in preaching than to preach the text and to preach Christ. Those are the two sort of, um, you know, uh, pillars of preaching. But as you look at the text and you discern how you wanna bring Christ to the people, one of the things that I always wanna do, did you guys, um, I know you've had some homiletics classes, did you guys encounter Brian Chapel and the fallen condition focus? Does that mean anything to you? It does, right? So I love that idea. And I sometimes talk about it as the human condition focus. Um, fallen condition focuses, you know, where do we see brokenness or sin? Human condition focuses, what's true for all the people in the room that I'm about to speak to, whether or not they're a Christian? So as an example, um, in a recent sermon I preached at our church on David and Goliath, uh, um, or sorry, on, on David's anointing, there's that great part of the passage where God said, uh, you know, uh, Samuel says, um, man looks at the outward appearance, but God looks at the heart. And so the question that I wanted to address or raise during that sermon was, how do we learn to see other people the way God does? Because our culture trains us to see people through the eyes of our, you know, through superficial eyes. How do they look? How do they appear on Instagram? In other words, this question of authenticity, this question of what does it mean to be a person that has a reputation, a person that is seen, a person that is successful, that's in people's minds in a city like London. So what I was trying to do was help them see the relevance of that passage for the questions that they're asking. They might not sit down with me and say, hey, Bijan, I wanna talk about image, body image or whatever, but that's certainly a question that animates life in London. And so what I was trying to do was bring the text to bear and say, these are questions that you're all wrestling with. These are questions that people in our city are wrestling with. Let's take a look at what God says. So that's how I think about contextualization. It may not be that someone specifically has said to you, hey, James, can we talk about body image and how people appear? But you know that that's in the cultural drinking water of your city. And so you're looking at the text to see how does the text speak and address that question. Does that make sense? Push back if I can further amplify or clarify. Yeah, so that's great. That's a really great question. So that's part of what the challenge is as a pastor, as a um, preacher, is helping people feel those questions, the things that are deep under the surface in their hearts that they might be burying. Your job is to start poking to help that beach ball start to rise to the surface. So uh, I think it was this past Sunday. Was it this past Sunday? I don't remember. It was either this past Sunday or the one before. But you know, right now in the UK and London, everyone's grieving the queen. Everyone's um, sad in one way or another. Sad for various reasons. Um, so as a preacher, one of the things that I'm able to do is say, why, I mean, everybody dies. Literally everybody dies. Why are you, we all grieving so much? And the answer is because as long as we've all been alive, and that's true for most of the people in my church, the queen has been on her throne. And we started to take for granted that she would always be there because we're looking for something constant in a world of change. We're looking for stability in a world of upheaval. And we just realized that even something as permanent as the queen wasn't permanent enough. And so what you're doing is you're poking and you're trying to surface and you're trying to make people feel the stuff that's there that they might not normally want to bring to the surface. Um, it's an art, it's not always easy. I'm not sure that I always do it well, but what you're trying to do as a pastor is be really sensitive to the, the points of contact that you have with people in your city and know how to press on those things. So another thing that I always do is I talk about um, 
you know, uh, something like loneliness, for example, and I'll say, why is it that in a world, in a city packed with people, so many of us feel alone? Because we know that what our souls most deeply need is not just being around other people, it's being seen and understood and loved. You notice nothing that I just said was explicitly Christian in the sense that I wasn't quoting chapter and verse, but I was surfacing something that someone says, oh yeah, it's totally my experience. And then we go to Ephesians 2 and say, what does it mean to be the church? What does it mean to be a community of faith in which we're actually seen and accepted and challenged to grow and change? So I'm kind of rambling here, but my point is that your job as the pastor is to help the beach ball get to the surface. And that's by seeing the points of contact, pressing gently and very respectfully and helping people start to see, oh yeah, I feel that, I need that. I mean, good preaching, and I'll say, I learned this from Tim Keller, I don't think I do this anywhere close to as well as he does, but good preaching isn't telling people things, it's making them feel it, right? So good preaching doesn't tell someone, Jesus died for you. Good preaching makes them feel in the moment, oh, Jesus died for me, and if I rest in that, everything will be okay. Like you feel it in a way that's more than cognitive. So that's what your goal is as a preacher. But sometimes you start by making them feel the human condition or the fallen condition focus of your passage. Am I speaking to what you're asking about? And then when you're doing one-on-one -on -one stuff, it's a lot easier to, to get at the questions people are asking because they can literally ask you, this is my question. Can I just say one more thing? I know you guys have had an amazing homiletics class, but this is why preaching and pastoring go together. Like it's actually very hard to be a preacher if you're not pastoring because the goal of preaching is to connect God's answers to people's questions, but it's the questions of the people you're pastoring. So, and, and I'll just say this, you know, if you, there are, in my estimation, there aren't a lot of great preachers out there who weren't at least at one part of their ministry really good pastors. Um, and I can say my experience working with Tim Keller, everybody knows him as a preacher, he's a darn good pastor. Like he's really good at sitting with people and listening to them and applying the gospel to the heart. He would not be as good of a preacher as he is if he wasn't as good of a pastor as he is. Because preaching is meant to apply the truth of the gospel to the hearts of the people that you're serving. And that's how you discern points of contact. You spend time with your congregation, you hear what's animating them, you hear what's scaring them, you hear what's weighing them down, and then you say, let's come to the text and see what it says. So you gotta spend time with your people, otherwise you won't, you won't know their questions. Anything else before we move on to talking about contextualization in the Bible? Okay, let's do it. So again, trying to root everything we say in this class, everything that we're talking about in scripture itself. So when we talk about contextualization in the Bible, we're asking two things basically. Number one, does the idea of contextualization conform to biblical teaching, or is this just something people made up recently? And if it does conform, are there any examples in the Bible that we can look to as examples for how contextualization is done well? So the first thing we want to see is, are there biblical texts that tell us about the importance of contextualizing? I think you know the answer is yes. So one of them is Romans chapter 1 and 2. The doctrine of sin means that as believers, we're never as good as our right worldview should make us. But at the same time, the doctrine of our creation in the image of God and an understanding of common grace remind us that non-believers are never as flawed as their false worldview should make them. This suggests that our stance, our stance toward every human culture should be one of critical enjoyment and appropriate wariness. Simply said, the idea here is that because of both the doctrine of creation and the doctrine of sin, we can enter into almost any situation and see things to both affirm and challenge. And what you're wanting to do as you put on those theological x-ray goggles that we talked about yesterday, when you expose and you explore, those are the places that you wanna contextualize to. Romans one and two gives us that theological grounding. Then of course, much more specifically, and Brian already brought this up earlier today, 1 Corinthians 9 is maybe the key text in the Bible about the minister of the gospel contextualizing the message. And let me just, uh, why don't we read it together because there's actually quite a lot in there. So if you wanna open up 1 Corinthians chapter nine, um, can somebody read 1 Corinthians 9 verses 19 through 23? 
Very good. So here's a question that I have for you. When Paul says, to the Jews I became like a Jew, to those without law I became as someone not under the law, what's he talking about? Like Paul was a Jew, but, you know, he became like a Jew. What, what does it mean that to those not under the law, I became like someone not under the law? What does he mean? So Acts 17 is a good example, right? Like to the Greeks, I became like a Greek. I read their stuff. I talked about things that they could understand, and I presented the gospel. But to the Jews, I would appeal to the Old Testament. I would make references to Abraham or Moses because those are authority structures in their worldview. But let me press you and say, this means something else that I think is important. When Paul says, I became like a Jew, or I became like one under the law, or I became like one not under the law, I almost think he's saying something like, I acted like a Jew, or I acted like someone not under the law. In other words, he adapted the culture, the habits, the characteristics, the lifestyle of the people that he was trying to reach and serve, but never doing so in a way that made him lose his gospel identity or his gospel distinctiveness. So a much more practical way to say it would be, if you're an Addis, there's various cultures here, and if you're trying to reach one of the cultures, then you want to have a church service. You want to use images, you want to relate to art and references that the people you're trying to reach would understand and embody. So very simple example. When our church was planted in New York City many, many years ago, um, you know, New York is a place of, uh, you know, excellence in music, specifically classical music and jazz. Those were two music forms that were very prominent in New York City when our church was planted. So our church decided, well, if that's the kind of music that New Yorkers like, then why don't we adopt those styles and put these classical hymns, these beautiful hymns that tell the story of God, richly biblical, but why don't we set them to music that people going to Lincoln Center, which is the major music uh, space in the Upper West Side of New York, if those people would go to Lincoln Center to listen to a great piece of music, why don't we try to offer great music that also brings out the message of Christ? So that a New Yorker could come into our church and say, wow, this music doesn't stink, it's actually okay. And in it, we're hearing the story of the gospel. That's just one tiny example of what it looks like. That would be a way of saying we became like New Yorkers in order to reach New Yorkers. And so the challenge for you is do you know your cultures well enough so that you could become like them in the sense that people see you and they say, wow, that person is like me, and yet they're a Christian, yet they love and trust Jesus. I guess I could explore that too. And you become a messenger that makes the gospel accessible because you've become like the people that you're reaching, not losing your gospel identity, but taking on style or habits or practices that help you fit in with the culture you're serving. Going way back, this is an example why, you know, old, some approaches to foreign missions, which was like, you come from the outside and you expect the people you're going to serve to start dressing like you, eating like you, you know, uh, is a sort of misguided approach to mission. But when you come in and say, we're here to serve, to love, we wanna adopt your culture, that's a way that I think you start to reflect more of the 1 Corinthians 9 model. Is that making sense? Any questions about that? Yeah. Uh -huh. Yeah. What do you guys think? Did you all hear the question? How far can you go? How far is too far when it comes to contextualizing the message? To do what the Bible says. Yeah. It's always a good answer. Can we unpack that more? Is there any, um, what are the guides? What are the markers? What are the, like, oh, you've gone too far kind of thing? Yeah, when the gospel's compromised. Yeah, let me say as clearly as I can, you know, you joked about it, but you've gone too far in over contextualizing or assimilating to the culture when you change the message of the Bible or when you change the message of the gospel. It's not, um, 
there's no uh, formula here. Our, our job is to present God's truth to people as clearly as we can, but never to change God's truth or God's message. What we must do as messengers is work really hard to make sure that the message which never changes is accessible, understandable, relevant, and relatable to the people we're speaking to, which often means becoming like them, having the language, the images, the force that they themselves could relate to. Um, so I'll just give you an example. When I'm preaching, I usually write my first draft of my sermon on Monday before the Sunday. And what I do as the week is going on is I come back to my manuscript and I look at it and I say, is there a way to say this that a Londoner would better understand? And specifically, I often think of my barber. Uh, don't laugh, I do go to a barber sometimes. Um, but he's a classic, you know, 20 something British guy living in East London. So I'm thinking to myself, if I'm sitting in there, and I often do talk to him about this stuff, if I'm sitting in the barber chair and I'm trying to explain this to him, would he get it? And if not, then I ask myself, is there a way that I could say it a little bit more accessibly? Not changing the message, never. But saying it and presenting it in a way with illustrations, images, and language that'll make it more accessible to him. And if I've discovered that there's a rich biblical word, like if I'm preaching in 1 John and I'm coming against propitiation, I love that word, but I just want to make sure I define it. I just want to make sure I say this is what it means and maybe try to give an example to help a Londoner get it. So the message never changes. And if you ever feel like, oh my gosh, I have to compromise this biblical truth in order to make the message relevant to Londoners or to people in Addis, too far. You've crossed the line, you know, and you've got to come back. So the message never changes. We do our best to communicate. Now, of course, there are certain passages of the Bible that even discerning its meaning can be challenging, and that's a whole different story. But the sort of core elements of the gospel especially, you never water down that. You just work really hard to make it as clear and as accessible to the people you're speaking to by becoming like them as much as possible. Does that address? You asked the question. Yeah, does that help? No. Oh, making a counterculture. I got you, I got you. Well, that's where the, the community of the church comes in. So one of the things, and we'll talk about this more, I think, tomorrow, one of the things that I'm always trying to do in preaching is help people discern where they're being more shaped by the culture than they are by God's word and invite them into formation under God's story. So real discipleship is being shaped by God's story. So I'm always trying to expose, this is an area where we're being shaped by the culture. This is what discipleship would look like if we come back to Jesus as our main, um, you know, our main uh, story, our main for formative influence. So that's part of what I'm doing. You're also wanting to create communities where you live out these truths. The church becomes a kind of counterculture, an alternate city. It says to Addis or it says to London, this is what life under the gospel can and should look like. Um, is that, yeah, what I thought you were asking me, and this is really important, is how do you encounter culture? Like how do you know what the cultures are of the people that you're serving? And that's also a very important question because if you're gonna contextualize well, you have to understand what is the driving, animating influences of the people you're serving. So this is where my two cents as a pastor is it isn't so, <laughs> it isn't so much that you wanna go and sort of do all the cultural things, um, partly because that's exhausting and partly because maybe it's not appropriate for you as a pastor. But what you wanna do is listen really well to the people that you're pastoring. Because even if they have a really healthy walk with God, probably they're working with people, their kids are going to school with people who are exposed to all kinds of cultural influences, some really great, some more challenging. And they're gonna to wanna to know, how do I talk to my friends about the gospel? How do I think about you know, uh, this doctrine in light of the questions that so-and-so is asking? So if you listen really well to them as a pastor, you're learning about the cultural influences that are shaping your people. And then you as a pastor are able to say, okay, how do I preach? How do I counsel? How do we come up with, I don't know if you have them here, but like adult education classes or teaching spaces that will serve my people to help them encounter the culture as disciples of Jesus. So I thought that's what you were asking about. And I just thought I should say that. What's interesting is that, um, and I, it's good that you asked the question because we are gonna practice here in a little bit, like actually doing contextualization within Addis, but it's important that you said what you just said because I've tried to say to you guys over the past few days, 
that one of your challenges with me as your teacher is I don't know this city nearly as well as any of you do. So you're going to have to take some of what I'm saying and figure out how do we apply this? How do we contextualize what he said about contextualization to our context and to our ministry settings? But I would say these principles are the same. And even Paul the Apostle, he's primarily contextualizing the gospel to people who are very religious, not secular. And so you can find him as a model and as a guide. So I would say these principles hold, even though some of the examples that I'm giving might be more rooted in my experience of secular cities like New York or London. Um, but the principles about finding ways to become as like the people you're trying to reach and serve as possible without compromising the gospel or losing your gospel identity. So what that would mean if you're having a conversation with a Muslim, it might mean something as simple as you in Christ have a lot of freedom to eat what you want, to wear what you want, to do certain things on certain days, but maybe out of respect and to become like you were a Muslim friend, you choose to not eat certain things when you're around them, or you choose not to wear certain things or do certain things on certain days. Again, I'm not an expert here, but it would be saying, is there a way that I could be a little bit more accessible and relatable to this person so that as we have dialogue and conversation, I'm not throwing up unnecessary obstacles for them to encounter the message of Jesus. So that would be a way that I would think about can, that's not content. That's me. That's the messenger. That's contextualizing to help the message of the gospel become more uh, possible in terms of engagement. Does that make any sense? Okay. So I think it's real. I just don't think that it's always in terms of um, uh, content per se. Sometimes it's in the mode or the, the way we are acting as messengers, which is more what Paul is saying in 1 Corinthians 9. I became all things to all men. Not that I adapted my message to become all things to all men. Anything else before we move on to the next section? We can round out this point. The gospel will never be comfortable to any fallen society or to any sinful human being. Our goal is to make sure that we do not put any obstacles in the way of the gospel ourselves. That the only stumbling block is the stumbling block of the cross. And that the meaning of the cross is clear to all. That's what we're trying to do.